Uh, so our, our next speaker is Coy Allen. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and Pathobiology uh, here at Virginia Tech as part of the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Inter Veterinary Medicine. He began there in November of 2012. I uh, got his BS in Biology from East Carolina University, MS in Biology from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and PhD in Genetics and Molecular Biology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And then, interestingly, in addition, perhaps he's thinking ahead in terms of, of science management and entrepreneurship and so on, but in any case, he got his MBA with a concentration in biosciences management from North Carolina State University. Uh, he did postdoctoral work and then was a research assistant and research associate professor at the Lineberg Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. His research interests are in innate and adaptive immunity and host defense against pathogens and can cancer immunology. And his talk today is epithelial cells and their role in immunity. All right, thank you for the introduction. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, the grins and nods in the back. It's always a good sign. I hope everybody's enjoying the, uh, the presentation so far. I hope to continue the trend. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit outside of our comfort zone. This is something that we work on quite a bit in our lab, and that the epithelial cells. I'm also going to be a little bit more basic than some of the talks you've probably heard today. That's just to bring you all on board to a cell type that you probably aren't used to working with. Now, I think we all kind of have a concept of what epithelial cells are. However, what you typically don't think of is, is a role for them in the innate numerous parts, but they are critical. Uh, here at the top is a uh, or epithelial cells that you grew up in a lab. Uh, if you can see, they're actually very pretty cells, right? Uh, they're very complex cells. Uh, when we grow them up in the dish, we can take them from the coastal sites, typically the gut or the, uh, the lungs. We can grow them on a dish, and over the course of a few months, well, not a few weeks, it usually takes about six weeks, these cells will begin to polarize. They'll begin to form their cilia, the cilia will begin to beat, and eventually the cilia will begin to be all in, in, in uh, all together, which is actually a kind of neat uh, process, and it's a very powerful tool when you're trying to validate models associated with ghost technology. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the green at the top uh, here are uh, like the cilia, and the nuclei polarized down to the bottom of the cell, called the basolateral surface. So today we're going to be talking about a few aspects of the, of the epithelial cells that can affect mucosal model. Okay? Uh, the first thing we're going to discuss are some of the secreted factors. Mucosal so epithelial cells produce mucus. Uh, they come in two different types that we're going to discuss today. We have the mucus producing cells, and we also have the ciliated cells here as well. The ciliated cells are the ones you're probably most familiar with. However, they can differentiate it from novel cells, which are the ones responsible for production. Uh, in addition to mucus, these cells secrete type 1 interferons, and they also produce uh, very potent antimicrobial peptides known as uh, beta defensins, for example, or a good example of those peptides. They can also produce reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, so they're very potent. They produce very potent mediators that can, that can affect uh, the, the, the microbes that are trying to invade, uh, pathogenic or more almost the microbiome. They also provide, as we know, a physical barrier that protects the mucosal tissues. They can also be active participants in the immune response by secreting cytokines and chemokines. And that's what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today, uh, here, to recruit other, other white blood cells to the, uh, the site of infection. Uh, they are very pretty cells to look at. Again, this is a, a, they typically make the cover of, of journals when you work with them. You always should take a scanning electron micrograph picture because you never know when you might need it. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is some of the secreted effectors. Uh, as I discussed the mucins, if you look at the mucins, look at that, look at that. It's just a good mitch, right? It just looks sticky. Mucins and mucus production are what we typically think of when we have a, an infection, right? We have our, we have, we blow our nose, right? We have, we have our, our mucus production. Looking at this, though, so you can see that this is a very effective barrier. Bacteria, pathogens, elements of the microbiome have a hard time migrating through this web of mucins. Uh, mucins are produced by MUP genes. These are driven by NF kappa B signaling. We'll talk about a little bit about NF kappa B signaling as we move forward. NF kappa B is the master regulator of gene transcription. We usually think about it as for its role in driving cytokine chemokine production. But you should also be aware that it influences a lot of aspects of the mucosal and 
for the field of cell biology, including mucosal production. The antimicrobial peptides are another very potent defense mechanism that epithelial cells utilize. There's a lot of work right now studying antimicrobial peptides because they're such effect, they're so effective at, uh, at basically killing bacteria. Uh, based, because bacteria are developing a, a antibiotic resistance at an increasing rate, a lot of companies have sprung up developing uh, antimicrobial peptides, particularly beta defensins, as, a, as an alternative approach to classical uh, antibiotics. Epithelial cells also produce immunoglobulins. All right, they secrete or release quite a bit of immunoglobulins into the, the, uh, into the mucosa, into the mucus, uh, or at least they allow the passage of these, of these immunoglobulins. Typically, you're talking about IgE into the mucus. And this, of course, is you're tagging all the, all the epitopes and all, the, uh, all of the antigens in the mucus so that it makes the presentation much more effective. We're not really going to discuss the immunoglobulins quite as much. We are going to talk quite a bit more about the use so some of my work involves, involves pattern recognition receptors, which we're going to get to. And one of the effects of activating pattern recognition receptors is the activation of the kappa B. When the kappa B is activated, in addition to producing cytokines and chemokines, we also get mucus production. These are epithelial cells. This is the, uh, the epithelial cells later from the, the intestine. These were samples I did last week, as a matter of fact, so just in time for this talk, right? So we prepped some of these with alpha blue periodic acid shift staining. And it produces a very pretty picture of uh, the goblet cells and mucus in the gut and also the lungs. This is classically used in the lungs, but we modified it to, to function in the gut as well. What you're looking at are the dark blue circles here. These are the dark blue areas are the goblet cells. The light blue areas are the mucus. Now, we flush our colons out when we prep them, so if we didn't flush them out, we would have a much denser light blue area around the tops of the crypts here, or around the tops of the filler. Now, when we challenge these mice with pathogens, with uh, DSS, which is shown here, that's uh, dextrin sulfate sodium, this is inducing colitis, uh, we cause mucus hypersecretion, we cause inflammation. And as part of this, you can see that the, the animals that were challenged with uh, AOM, which is a tumor inducing agent, and the DSS, which are inflammatory balancing, basically, they, have, they produce more mucus, they have more goblet cell hypertension compared to our mock treated mice, which are under control condition. So mucus is really important. Uh, mucus helps prevent bacteria pathogens from reaching the epithelial cell layer. Now a lot of the animals that I work with that are lacking pattern recognition receptors also lack the ability to produce mucus in significant numbers that are in a significant volume. And the problem with this is that it allows bacteria to get into areas of the grips that have become inaccessible and it creates a niche for the bacteria to overgrow. So a lot of the pattern recognition receptor mice that I work with that lack pattern recognition receptors actually have problems with specific bacteria that overgrow because they, they, are, they are, are allowed to gain access into regions of the colon that they wouldn't normally be able to gain access to. Now this is just a diagram uh, of uh, just a schematic of how mucus works, right? We don't usually think about all the dynamics of mucus, but there's actually an entire field of science that studies this, okay? Uh, the mucus layer in the gut and in the lungs are typically somewhere between 10 and 100 microns in depth, and this allows just a, a really nice overview of how mucus works. It, it keeps all, most of the bacteria and, and elements of the microbiome at the top. The secreted factors tend to be more in the middle to bottom areas of the mucus, uh, close to the epithelial cells. So. Now we have problems when we encounter pathogens that are able to navigate this mucus. A lot of pathogens can actively swim through the mucus basically because they're flagellated. Uh, salmonella is a good example. There's some other bacteria that are able to produce enzymes and, and proteolytic enzymes that are able to break down the mucus that allow the mucus, that allow the bacteria to, to literally just digest its way down to the epithelial cells. Once at the epithelial cells, then that's where the, the epithelial cell itself will encounter the pathogen. At that point, the epithelial cell now becomes an active participant in the innate immune response. Okay? Now, by active, I mean it, it, these cells express classes of pattern recognition receptors. Now, my lab studies these three classes of pattern recognition receptors. These are the, I would, I would argue these are the main classes. There are some others. For example, C-type lectin receptors are up here. But these are, I would say, the best characterized. Uh, and these happen to be the ones I worked on as well. So uh, our lab studies toll-like receptors, rig-like helicase receptors, and nod-like receptors. 
We study these in the context of epithelial cells and also in the context of the immune cells themselves, mostly macrophages. And so a lot of what I'm going to tell you today that's associated with epithelial cells also apply to macrophages and other uh, leukocytes as well. Now, the toll-like receptors here are probably the best characterized of the pattern recognition receptors. I think everyone in here probably is familiar with, with, with the toll-like receptors, or at least you've heard of them. And for the purposes of today's talk, I've simplified these, these signaling pathways down to sort of their essence. Okay? So following toll-like receptor activation, the majority of toll-like receptors signal through the mighty AD8 adaptive protein. And the net result of toll-like receptor activation is the activation of cytokine genes. Uh, due to the cap B activation. Again, this is the master regulator to introduce Now, I'm going to tell you about these other two pathways, but I want you to understand that all three of these pathways interact with one another. It becomes a very complex web. However, after seeing some of the talks today and through the, this conference, I can see that interacting webs don't, don't, aren't, aren't a problem for you guys, right? So that's the whole point of computer modeling, you're generating all those webs and interaction. But for today, I wanted to simplify it down to its essence. Much more complex. Now, the toll like receptors activate in kappa B. What about these other two classes of pattern recognition receptors? Uh, the, the next class we're going to discuss is the ring like helicase receptors. These are almost, I, I, I would be surprised if you've heard of them. However, they are a very interesting family of pattern recognition receptors that are responsible for sensing viruses. There are two main members of these pattern, uh, the ring like family, the ring I and the F5. These are responsible for sensing very specific sets of viruses. Right? They sense basically viral RNA or, uh, or viral nucleic acids. Then they interact, once they sense these pathogens, they interact with MAPS. MAPS is the mitochondrial antiviral signaling protein. As the name would suggest, MAPS uses the mitochondria as a scaffold to drive the innate immune response. It's a very interesting field that we're working into. Over the last five years, there's been a lot of work characterizing these receptors how they interact, and how they use the mitochondria as a scaffold. This is really important in the context of epithelial cell biology, because if you remember, I told you that the epithelial cells polarize. Well, one part or one aspect of that polarization is the migration of the mitochondria in the cells up to the cilia. If you think about it, the nucleus translocates down to the basolateral surface, the mitochondria translocate up to the apical surface, which is right under the cilia. The cilia. Well, the, there, there's two reasons for this. The first reason is that the cilia need energy. So the mitochondria are right there to provide energy to the cilia to be. But if you think about it, by being tethered to the mitochondria, by using that as a scaffold, we've evolved this mechanism to place the pattern recognition receptors directly under the point of entry for viruses when they come into epithelial cells. And this is the case for uh, viruses that we study in our lab, that's the work of RSV and influenza which come into the cell right at the epithelial cell surface, at the apical surface, right below the cilia, and they're immediately sensed by these scaffold, these scaffold proteins that are used in mitochondria as a scaffold. Following activation, the ring out like case receptors uh, drive IRF transcription, uh, drive the transcription of type 1 interferon genes through IR3 and IRF7. And then the last group of, of pattern recognition receptors we're going to discuss are the nod-like receptors, NLRs. Right? Nod-like receptors are just a, a, are a, are an easy way to pronounce the name. The real name of these are the nucleotide, uh, let me see, nucleotide binding polymerization domain containing leucine rift repeat receptor protein yeah. All right, So huge name, right? So we're just going to call them nod-like receptors. Or in the for the rest of the talk. Uh, there are several functional groups of NLRs. Uh, there are 22 NLRs that have been characterized in humans and other mammalian species. Uh, of those, only about half are well characterized. They've been identified but aren't very well characterized functionally. Uh, and of these, the, the best characterized subgroup are the NLRs that form a multi-protein complex, which is known as the inflammatory. This is a, a, a large multimeric protein complex that comes together upon activation of the NLR or the sensing of a pathogen. And they form this inflammasome, which is responsible for the processing and cleavage of pro-IL-1 beta and pro-IL-18 into their mature cytokines. So these two cytokines are really potent regulators of the immune response. They drive a lot of aspects that we think of uh, when we think of being sick. For example, their uh, IL-1 beta is a pyrogenic enzyme, a cytokine. So when you have a fever, it's because you have high levels of IL-1 beta, among other cytokines. So these are really potent mediators of the innate immune response. 
IL-18 is really important in the context of the, of the mucosa because IL-18 is a very potent cytokine. It's also a very potent uh, moderator or, or modulator of epithelial cell regeneration and repair. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more as we move forward. All right, so the epithelial cells, when they engage pathogens, when they engage elements of the microbiome, it's really important that they maintain a balanced response. They're always coming in contact with elements of your, of your gluten, okay? So it's really important that they not immediately signal an immune response. And they do this through a couple different ways. Uh, one is physically locating the physical location of the pattern recognition receptors. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the toll-like receptors. In general, toll-like receptors, we can consider those as being extracellular versus the NLRs, the radial like helicases, which are cytosol. Okay? There are some exam there are some there are some, there are some toll receptors that are intracellular, but for the purposes of, of today, we're just going to focus on the extracellular receptors. And if you look, this is a really nice diagram that shows the epithelial cells here. It shows the base of the cribs here with the pan cells. This is the basolateral surface of the of the epithelial cells on the bottom. Maybe the surface of the ciliated areas at the top. Okay? And the lumen is here. Of the tissue itself. Okay? Now, if you look at these cells, they orient their pattern recognition receptors on the basal lateral surface. In general, most of the epithelial cells that express high levels of, of TLRs, they're oriented on the basal lateral surface. This is a physical way that you can restrict the initiation of the immune response. Because bacteria connecting here at the cilia won't activate the immune response, but if you have a barrier breach, if you have a chronic condition, for example, if you have epithelial cell damage, you have bacteria that translocate from the lumen into the tissue, that places these pattern recognition receptors now at a very good point where they can, they can interact with these pathogens, interact with these microbes, and drive the immune response because they know that the pathogens or the microbes have now entered an area of the tissue where they shouldn't be. So that's a very nice physical way that the cells can orient these pattern recognition receptors that can maintain some level of balance. Now that's not the case with all of the epithelial cells. There are some that differentiate, particularly near the pyrus patch, that do have some, some toll-like receptors. TLR2 and TLR5 are probably the best characterized. These are usually near the M cells. M cells are specialized phagocytic cells that allow antigens to pass from the lumen to the, to the, to the uh, pyrus patch area, so it allows antigen presentation. And because of this, this is sort of a, a weak point in your defense system. And so it's thought that the epithelial cells that surround that need to really bulk up their defenses. And so by doing that, they express, uh, they express some of these pattern recognition receptors on both sides. This allows for the host to maintain some low level, some baseline level of inflammation. It allows recruitment of, of uh, leukocytes to the pyrus patches. So you have this baseline level, and that's one way that the epithelial cell counts. But I will tell you that, that the expression of toll receptors on that, on that endocrine side is, is rare. I mean, it only happens in very specific conditions. Now, once, a, once you have a barrier breach, so, you, so uh, here we're showing the barrier breach, so we've had some sort of damage to the epithelial cells. We have bacteria that translocate from the lumen into the, into the mucosa tissue. Those bacteria are recognized by a diverse repertoire of toll-like receptors on both the, the leukocytes as well as the epithelial cells. We've done quite a bit of studies looking at toll-like receptor knockout animals, looking at mighty 88 deficient mice. So when you knock out mighty 88, you're basically knocking out almost all of the toll-like receptors. So you knock out everybody except TLR3. Uh, we've also done several, several studies looking at TLR2 uh, and TLR4 specific knockout animals and different models of infection. So looking at uh, uh, various viruses and bacteria, as well as in the context of inflammatory bowel disease, and also in the context of asthma as well. And in all of these situations, the, the moral of the story is basically the same. If you don't have toll receptor signaling, you tend to have a reduced production of NF-kappa B activity. Right? So, so in general, I'm being very general here. But when you lack NF-kappa B, you lack the pro-inflammatory cytokine signals. And in the context of bacteria, what that allows, it allows the bacteria to make inroads into the tissue. So the bacteria are able to migrate much farther beyond the epithelial cells into the tissue eventually entering the bloodstream. What we typically find when we're looking at uh, bacteria infections in these knockout animals is that we tend to get a systemic infection much sooner. Uh, in general, as you would predict, when you knock out your elements of your main immune response, it, it becomes very hard to control bacteria and viruses. And what we typically end up with are, uh, are uh, cases of sepsis, 
for the bacteria making it to distal organs such as the liver, the spleen, and ultimately the animal has to be euthanized. Um, so in the context of inflammatory bowel disease, so in the context of knocking out these genes uh, in, in the gut and then inducing inflammation, usually using the DSS, uh, we also see that this is detrimental to both the epithelial cells as well as the, the leukocytes. We've been able to show using different different models, for example, bone marrow chimera studies and different uh, uh, genes or cell type specific knockouts in these pathways. That uh, the, the epithelial cells play a vital role here as well as the leukocytes. And uh, in general, when you knock out these receptors, you tend to get more chronic inflammation as well. So it's, it's, it has to do with the bacteria being able to constantly signal through other pattern recognition receptors and making it past this barrier uh, into areas where it should be sort of maintain this low level of inflammation. Now the inflammasomes are a little bit different story. Okay? This is really one of the main focus areas of my lab. Uh, we study uh, NLRs in the context of inflammasome forming NLRs as well as other functional groups of NLRs. We'll discuss in a little bit more detail. Uh, this pathway may look a little confusing again, but uh, I'll try to summarize it. So what we have are inflammasome forming NLRs. NLRs here. These are cytosolic receptors, and so we're sensing intracellular pathogens, intracellular stress, intracellular or, and damage, which can cause intracellular changes. Uh, different NLR, different NLRs sense very specific stimuli. For example, a family of for example, there's, there's an NLR that senses flagella, so it responds to flagellated bacteria. There's another NLR in RP3, which is shown here, which is the best characterized NLR because it's the most promiscuous. It seems to, to be activated by a whole suite of stimuli. Following activation, the NLR will undergo conformational change. In this case, MRP3 can be activated by, we, we, we've looked at high level labs, we've looked at a, a wide variety of damps, we've looked at uh, potassium and calcium, we've looked at reactive oxygen species production, LPS, IIC. All of these seem to activate MRP3. The, the way that it seems to be activated is, is associated with changes in the intracellular environment rather than sensing a specific light. Uh, and so following activation, it undergoes a conformational change. You know, this long string of leucine rich repeats is normally folded over these, the, the nucleotide binding domain and the, uh, the pyro domain, which is here. Uh, so we usually have this folded protein, but upon activation, it, it opens up. When it opens up, it allows binding of oligomerization to other NLRP3 molecules, which have also been activated, forming this, this large oligomeric structure. And at the same time, we have the formation of what's known as the ASC spec. ASC is an adaptive protein that facilitates inflammasome function and inflammasome activation. And this spec and this NLR function together to recruit and activate caspase 1. The net result of NLR inflammasome activation is the activation of caspase 1. Caspase 1 is a caspase, it cleaves molecules. In this case, caspase 1 specifically targets pro alum beta and pro al 18 for cleavage, and you then have the maturation of these, these uh, cytokines, which they can use. Now, at the same time, caspase 1 is also associated with a very novel form of cell death known as pyroptosis. Again, when you're talking about the epithelial cell layer, uh, that's really important because you want to avoid epithelial cell death at all costs. And pyroptosis is a very specialized form of cell death, it's a very controlled form of cell death. Uh, mediated by caspase 1. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that also as we go forward. Now, in addition to what's known as the canonical inflammasome activation shown here, we also have uh, activation known as, which is driven by caspase 11. This is a very new hot field in the inflammasome world. Uh, we are working on caspase 11 now. Uh, we, we just recently submitted a, a manuscript for caspase 11. But this activates what's known as the non canonical inflammasome. Uh, this is uh, very interesting work. Turns out that a lot of the previous studies looking at caspase 1 were using animals that were actually caspase 1 and caspase 11 double deficient. So we, we just found that out back in 2011. So a lot of studies have now gone back to try to figure out that it tease out the differences between caspase 1 biology and caspase 11 biology. Uh, and the non canonical inflammasome is, is a major mediator of pyroptosis. But it can also feed back. It's been shown to be uh, elements of, of non canonical inflammatory signaling. It's been shown to be essential for driving the canonical inflammatory There's a lot of work trying to tease these two, these two out. So it's a very complex system. 
we have a very limited repertoire of NLRs that sits a whole suite of pathogens and elements of the microbiome. These, these, active, these, these uh, NLRs signal through a diverse range of signal pathways, ultimately leading to the formation of the inflammatory zone. And a lot of this isn't well understood. That's one place where I think uh, computational modeling can really help in this field, is to try to tease out what drives this non-canonical inflammatory zone versus the canonical. What are the what are the the ligands these NLRs recognize in that their computational changes? Now there are only six of the 22 NLRs that have been characterized as forming an inflammatory zone. Somehow these six are responsible for recognizing the whole repertoire of bacteria and elements in microbes. Micro so it's a very complex system that we don't really fully really understand. So in the context of intestinal homeostasis. The NLRs have been uh, shown to be vital. Uh, some of my own work is, is summarized here. Uh, we've shown that elements of the NLR fibrosome are essential for maintaining intestinal homeostasis. And all, all, when we started these projects, we assumed that when we knocked out elements of the fibrosome, caspase 1, PIPARD, or ASC, and uh, different NLRs, we would have reduced inflammation because we would have reduced IL-1 beta and IL-18 level. And sure enough, that's what happens. When we knock out these genes, and we challenge the mice in models of inflammatory bowel disease, we get reduced levels of these two cytokines. Yet we get increased disease. We get significantly increased colitis. These mice have significantly increased tumor genesis. So in the information during the tumor genesis model, uh, the mice are worse off. So how could that be? We've knocked out a major pro-inflammatory mediator. We've knocked out two very potent pro-inflammatory cytokines. Well, it turns out that the secret lies with IL-18. It took us a, a couple years to figure this out. So we were originally approaching this that IL-1 beta and IL-18 were run from the cytokines. But it turns out that, that IL-18, by being a potent moderate modulator of epithelial cell regeneration and repair, turns out that, that loss of that trumps loss of the pro-inflammatory cytokine effects. So what happens when we are working with mice lacking elements of the NLR zone, likewise mice lacking MIT-88, which is important for uh, gene transcription uh, to generate that pro, the pro forms of those cytokines. Turns out when, we, when we're working with mice or animals lacking these genes, we're getting reduced IL-18 and we're also getting reduced epithelial cell uh, regeneration repair. So this is causing damage to these epithelial cells. This is allowing more bacteria to translocate into deeper areas of the mucosal tissue, signaling through other modulators such as IL-6, TNF alpha. Those levels tend to increase. So by, by lacking this epithelial uh, regeneration repair process, these, these epithelial cells uh, are much worse off, uh, allowing more bacteria to translocate, maintaining this very low level of inflammation all the time in the gut. Right? This causes a lot of neutrophils to be recruited, and over time those neutrophils cause more and more damage. In the context of tumor genesis, what we've actually found is that uh, the, the, the deficient repair processes will eventually, over the course of uh, a few months, result in extensive colitis-associated cancer. So you have increased inflammation, you have increased bacterial translocation, you have reduced mucus. Remember I was talking about mucus earlier? You have reduced mucus, so you have bacteria able to enter areas that they normally wouldn't be in the gut. And you maintain this persistent infection, you maintain this, this persistent inflammation, which drives the NLRP6 is probably one of the best characterized NLRs associated with the epithelial cell process here. Uh, the NLR that I work on, the NLRP3, is predominantly associated with macrophages. We've been able to look at, uh, using bone marrow chimeras, uh, we've been able to look at these different genes uh, in tissue-specific contexts. Uh, and NLRP6 is expressed in epithelial cells uh, and, and controls that aspect. Uh, under normal conditions, we have a healthy gut microbiota and engages the NLRP6 inflammasome, which drives mature IL-18 production, leading to endotheric gamma, and also drives the regeneration repair process. However, the absence of NLRP6, you don't have the NLRP6 inflammasome. What happens is that these epithelial cells begin to release CCL5. Uh, CCL5 is a very potent neutrophil recruitment uh, cytokine, or chemokine, rather. And when you have uh, potent levels of CCL5 and neutrophils coming in, again, the neutrophils cause extensive collateral damage in these mice, and that will drive the inflammation. Uh, on the flip side, when we lack NLRP3 or the NLRP3 inflammasome in the macrophages, the macrophages responding to these sites of inflammation lack the ability to produce IL-18 uh, 
And again, you have that deficient deterioration pair process. Very similar, very similar net results in both cases. One is driven by epithelial cell component particles, and one is driven by the macronutrients. Um, also, when you re remove ASC or caspase 1, either one of these, these mice are highly susceptible. They're hypersensitive to inflammation from genogenesis, and any gut infection, any gut pathogen, because they lack the ability of both the epithelial cells and the microfilms to, to drive the process. So they're significantly more hypersensitive. Now, the other uh, aspect that I'm just going to hit on here is pyroptosis. This is a very distinct form of cell death. It's distinct because it's driven by caspase 1 and, and or caspase 11. Uh, it's much more controlled than necrosis. Uh, this is a much more controlled cell death. What we think occurs here, we think pyroptosis is a major mediator of epithelial cell denuding. Uh, when we infect, for example, mice with influenza that lack elements of the, of the inflammasome, um, we, can see, we can see reduced levels of pyroptosis. What we also see are increased levels of epithelial cell damage and stress. And so one of the ways that epithelial cells can combat viruses, sort of the last resort, is a denuding process. When the epithelial cells are infected with the virus that it can't clear, one of the processes is to enter this controlled cell death process where it denudes from the underlying tissue. If you look at epithelial in, in the airways, a lot of times you'll see areas that are that don't that lack epithelial cells, especially following influenza. That's that's an area we look at quite a bit. You can see these epithelial cells have come off in sheets. Uh, likewise, when you get a, 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 a pathogen in your gut, a lot of the times the, the, the diarrhea you have is full or you can clearly see your epithelial cells. They've shed the underlying layer. This is a last resort for epithelial cells to get rid of virus. So if you think about it, they become this pocket of replicating virus. So what else is left to do except, in, except release yourself from the underlying tissue and be excreted by the, by the by, through coughing, through diarrhea, through sneezing, whatnot. Just get out of the system. And that's actually a very effective means to get rid of the virus, but then you leave your underlying tissue exposed. And a lot of times when you're looking at just the pathology slides for these samples, you can see white blood cells filling in behind these areas of the moon. So you'll see concentrations of leukocytes under these areas of the airway or gastrointestinal tissues. And pyroptosis, we think, is a major mediator of this process. Now, like I said, there are NLRs have, are, are very specific. So they sit to very specific aspects of different bacteria and viruses. Uh, the ones we've looked at, we looked at NLRP3, NLRC4, NLRP6, well, I guess we've looked at all of them. Uh, we published on these, uh, the NLRC, NLRP3, NLRC4, and P6. Uh, we are about to publish here, and I have some background information on this one, but I'm not going to say anything about that today. Um, but, uh, NLRP3 and NLRC4, again, these are examples of, of specificity for the NLRs. Uh, NLRC4 recognizes flat flagella, so it recognizes flagellated bacteria. NLRP3, again, recognizes much more robust signals. We think it senses changes in the intracellular composition of, uh, of different factors. Right? So mostly potassium and calcium. Uh, again, NLRP1, NLRP1 uh, we've also shown it has an effect in, in these processes. Uh, so far, it only has been shown to be recognized to recognize anthrax and anthrax lethal toxin, and also toxin like gondia. Uh, but we've also shown we've shown that we're, we're, we're in the process of publishing this that it also affects uh, inflammatory bowel disease, as do really all of these. And it's because they sense different elements of the uh, of the microbiota, different pathogens, that we really I mean it, each one sits it's very specific forms a very specific inflammasome in response to a specific stimuli. So it's not all that surprising that each one of them, if you remove it from the system, you get a different overgrowth or different translocation of bacteria, but the net result is the same. They're still more sensitive. Now, in addition to driving the immune response, pathogens also have evolved to modulate the inflammasome. Right? Pathogens have evolved elements that litter to, to functionally inhibit these, these uh, Innate immune responses. For example, NS1, the flu NS1 protein, which is here, directly uh, affects caspase 11. Again, I told you caspase 11 is important for pyroptosis. Uh, the flu is very dis it, it's a, it, it is very disadvantageous for the flu for epithelial cells to denude. So it's, it's reasonable to think that the reason it's targeting caspase 11 is to stop that pyroptosis process so you keep the airway epithelial cells attached to the normal. 
Um, there are lots of examples of the fluid S1 protein, though it's a very nice example of a, of a pathogen associated modulator of inflammation. It affects rig IL receptors as well. And S1 targets rig I, which is the primary pathogen recognition receptor responsible for sensing. It targets the, the, the RNA processing of that, of that kind of recognition. So there are lots of examples of pathogens that can modulate the function of the chromosomes, not only of chromosomes, but all of the other pattern recognition. Alright, so those are the pro-inflammatory anti-recognition receptors. The toll-like receptors that are pro-inflammatory, the non-like receptors that are pro-inflammatory, right? I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of our work looking at inhibitory NLRs. This is a new field, a new direction. As I said, the 22 different NLRs, we won't really characterize half of them. The more we characterize them, the more we uncover some very unique properties in the ones that have yet to be fully characterized. In this context, we have the inhibitory NLRs. There are three of them so far that we've characterized that fall into this functional subgroup. NLRP12, NLRC3, and NLRX1. Now these inhibit inflammation. They function through diverse mechanisms, but they all seem to converge on an NF-kappa B signal like at some point, uh, which is shown here. NLRP12 uh, inhibits the non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway through an interactive NIC trap 3 and it also affects the phosphorylation of IRF1. Uh, likewise, NLRC3 and NLRX1 also seem to interact with and inhibit TRAP6. So it's a very effective pathway. If you want to inhibit inflammation, target NF-kappa B. Yep. No direct interaction with NF-kappa No, no so far, far. Either. So far, we do not see any direct interaction. It's affecting, as a matter of fact, the, the hypothesis is that these NLRs form what's known as a trapezoid. So I talked about the inflammasome. It's a multi-protein complex. These NLRs are really good at forming multi-protein complexes. So far, all of the inhibitory NLRs have shown an affinity to trap molecules, be it trap 2, trap 3, or trap 6. That's a very effective way at uh, inhibiting a pathway upstream and having a far-reaching effect. Um, now, why would you want to inhibit inflammation? Well, inflammation is great when you get infected, when you're exposed to your microbiome, you want a robust inflammatory response. You want to clear that pathogen away. The problem is after the pathogen is gone, you have to resolve your inflammation. And we think these inhibitory NLRs are key bottlenecks or key mediators of this inflammation resolution. They dampen overzealous immune responses. So likewise, when you don't have them, most of our work has shown that when you don't have these inhibitory NLRs, you have hyperinflammation. You have hyperinflammation in the gut, you have hyperinflammation in the lungs. You fail to, you are able to control pathogens moderately better. The problem is that you can't shut down your immune response. You end up getting lots of hyperinflammation in the tissues. Uh, and again, you have that collateral damage associated with it. Now, they are much more complex than what I've just shown. They all converge on NF-kappa B signaling, but they also go off and do other things. Uh, NLRX1 is an excellent example of this. NLRX1 has been, is, is, uh, has been shown to negatively regulate NF-kappa B. It's also been shown to negatively regulate, type, negatively regulate the type 1 interferon response. NLRX1 interacts with MAPS, so it inhibits the binding of rig I to MAPS. So this is particularly important when you're exposed to viruses. Uh, following activation, rig I or NLRX1 senses the virus, virus at some point and will release MAPS to allow rig I binding. This will drive the production of type 1 interferon in IL-6. However, in addition to functioning as a negative regulator, NLRX1 has also been characterized as having some positive uh, regulatory effects as well. NLRX1 has been shown to function by interacting with the protein UQCRC2, which is, I can look it up, but it's important for reactive oxygen species production, okay? So NLRX1 can positively uh, uh, regulate the production of reactive oxygen species. It's also been shown to, to function with TUM, which is a part of this autophagy uh, complex, so it's also been shown to be a positive regulator of TUM, right? Very complex, and what, we're, what we think, our hypothesis for why it has all these different functions is that it's very subtype specific, it's very temporal specific, it's very pathogen specific. NLRX1 is a very broad reaching protein, as are the other NLRs in this group. And so it's very important that they, that they are tightly regulated. It's also very important uh, that they are effective at the, target, at the pathways that they target. So what we're seeing is that they tend to affect these pathways very high up. Uh, allowing shutdown of the, uh, of the, of the uh, final production. I know this is, a, this is the case in the context of pathogen infections. We've also looked at uh, MLRP12 in the context of colitis and colon cancer. And as you would expect, in the absence of MLRP12, which is here, 
We have increased non-canonical and high signal. signaling. Uh, this results in significant uh, downstream effects. Uh, and what we've actually been able to show is that in the absence of NORP12, we lose nf kappa b signaling or non-canonical nf kappa b signaling. This causes increased inflammation, increased tumorigenesis. And this is, uh, the main effect of this is that we lose CXCL12 and CXCL13 production, which are important for driving the chemokines that are highly associated with cancer. And so there, when, we, when we lose those, we lose those chemokines, which drive, which, which affects the genogenesis aspects. So uh, these, are, these are very interesting proteins, uh, very interesting family that we're working on. Um, and uh, we've been able to make a lot of good progress. All right, so I realize this is a diverse group of students, right? So group, diverse group of people. We've got computational people that have looked at me with, with just dead eyes, and we've got immunologists that have looked at me with interest and respect, maybe. We'll see. All right, but I'm not going to play the video because we're, a little, we're going to be a little short on time, and I, and I don't want to get into it. But this is a very nice video. It's Nature Immunology production, all right? This will cover mucosal immunology from start to finish in a very simplistic term, a very simplistic term, but it's great. It's a really good video. Copy down your, your, your web address here, all right? In your spare time, take a look at it. It is a very nice production. Right? If you beg me at the end, I might play, but we'll see, all right? Um, but I, I highly recommend it if, you, if you're a little bit uneasy with the immunology side, right? You've heard from, from folks about T-cells. You've heard from me about macrophages and these epithelial cell things. Right? So I highly recommend it. Alright, right, so how can computational modeling help us? I hope you got the impression that we don't really know a lot of things about these pattern recognition receptors. They've been around for years. They've been around, this, the, the toll like receptors have been studied for 40 years. Alright? In one form or another. But we still don't fully understand mechanisms. We, the NLRs are a decade old, and we only have, I hear somebody has already started, fantastic. All right, so the NLRs have been around for about a decade, uh, and we are just, we still haven't characterized all of them. We have found the low-hanging fruit, ones that affect and that affect ion beta ion gene production. Very low-hanging fruit. You have a you have a, a very defined pathway. You have a very defined output. So no so it's no wonder that they're the best characterized NLRs. So what we hope is that computational modeling can begin to link a lot of these complex interactions between immunity, metabolism, and microbiota and provide us with a way to, to look at these pattern recognition receptors as therapeutics, okay? Do we want to activate them? Do we want to inhibit them? In all of our animal studies, we've shown that when we inhibit them, that's a very bad thing. The mice get really sick. But when we activate them, can we, can we enhance their activities? Can we make them more efficient than they do? So that's one thing that we're interested in looking at. So, so making links between these complex, you cut back to other elements, metabolism, immunity, all these different functions, we hope that we can Competition while we're all this together. We want to be able to design therapeutics, right? We want to be able to look at these pattern recognition receptors using databases and use structure based virtual screening to look at large libraries of compounds that can activate these receptors or inhibit these receptors. There are, I can certainly see advantages to both. All right, so one of the issues with the pattern recognition receptor family in general are that we have these great human genetic studies these great uh, genome-wide screening results, showing different subpopulations with all these mutations in these genes. They're all associated with disease, in, 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 for example, inflammatory bowel disease. The problem is that there, for every study we have showing association, we have two studies that show they're not associated. So we end up getting conflicting data. We end up getting lots of conflicting results. So we hope that computational modeling can help reconcile some of these conflicting results. Both, with, both in population studies as a whole, but also in the, the NLR and TLR fields themselves. A lot of these proteins are highly controversial. NLR is one you get yelled at every time you talk about NLR is one because some people think it's pro-inflammatory, some people think it's anti-inflammatory. Everybody in the field is mean. They don't get along, and so it's, it's quite controversial as to what it actually does. And so we're all left in the middle just trying to, just trying to do our best to figure out the pathways. Okay? So we're hoping that computational model can help give us a, a, a better definition of what these these LRs and TLRs are doing, all right? And again, the my feeling is that there's a lot of cell type specificity here. There are a lot there's a lot of temporal dynamics that we don't understand. And so we're hoping the computational model can help us shed some light on some of the more specific aspects that, that we're just missing in culture of microbiome. It, it makes a big difference whether we're working with 
alternatively activated macrophages or classically activated macrophages. Epithelial cells come in multiple flavors, right? And so we're hoping that we can investigate some of these, these specific, some of these specifics in the epithelial. All right, so with that, I'll open the floor up for any questions. I've bombarded you with a lot of information, right? So, does anybody have anything to ask? Yeah. I was wondering if you were studies and you had any chance to look at Tony's function and their impact on the epithelial integrity of the immune function? So no, we haven't. Uh, so we use epithelial cells more as a tool. Uh, and so so the answer, the short answer is no, we haven't. It's a, it's a good avenue to look at, um, but it's just something we haven't looked at. Anybody else? Hit the cell culture. Is there a cell no, these are primary cells taken from humans. So the question is, in our epithelial cell culture, work, are they cell are they cell lines or primary cells? And they're primary cells. We take them from humans or from animals, from mice. Most of the time, we use mice. Human cells are hard to come by. Um, but we we culture them from both. Uh, they are a very nice system. We cost their, their primary cells. Now, if you just take epithelial cells out, if you grow them up on a dish without doing anything else, they'll expand and they'll grow. They'll have a very fibroblast. They'll have a very fibroblast type of biology. To get them to, to polarize like that, you have to use uh, transmole plates. You have to grow them on the surface with, with an air interface so that they polarize. It's the only form of meat. So it's, very, it's a very challenging process, but it's, it's one that is definitely worthwhile to do because you get the epithelial cells in their natural state rather than as a fire that just spread out of the fish. Yep. Have you ever looked at, um, like, over time, like from the neonates? So yes, so the question is, have we looked at expression of NLRs over time, or we're in TLRs too, right? So TLRs, NLRs over time, in neonates, and all the way up through development. And the, and the answer is, kind of, okay? It, it, we, we, we don't know a lot about these, but I'll tell you that the NLRs, most of the NLRs that are characterized have maintain a set level of expression. Some people will show studies where they activate or stimulate, and they get increased NLR expression. We haven't really seen that except under very specific con conditions. What we think are that these are very stably expressed pattern receptors. They, they, it is important that you maintain this balance. You don't want to, to have to rely on transcription and translation for these really important sensors. And so in a lot of cases, now, now so, so the answer to your question is, yes, people have looked at it and know there's not a big difference over time in the cell types that have been looked at. And most of the cell types that have been looked at are hematopoietic receptors. Most of the people in these fields only study these receptors in the context of macrophages, to be honest with you. Um, there's some different cell work and intricate work in small groups, but most of the people use macrophages as their primary cell. That being said, there are some NLRs that are critical for development. If you knock out MLRP2, you end up with embryonic development. And if you knock out N kappa B associated genes, so some, you, know, you end up also there with tough to work with N kappa B and knock out them as well. So, so they're, they're certainly in some cases. The answer is yes. I'm sure the question probably changes. To answer your direct question, I don't know. <laughs> yep. Yep. You did that uh, exam activation on RSV section. Yes, yeah. Uh, RSV is uh, middle RP3 of Lamasome since it's RSV. Uh, we have a manuscript in your Embo reports of PLOS One, something along those lines. We took a, it was a battle to get published. But uh, RSV activates middle RP3 of Lamasome. So if you don't have LRP3, you end up getting increased levels of, of uh, RSV. RSV tends to, to grow much faster, tends to reproduce much faster, you get much faster in the absence of the LRP3 And what about strains of Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, we use three different strains. We collaborate with, with Santanao Bose uh, for that. He's an RSV specialist. On the top of my head, I can't remember. You can look up the papers. Yep. So what kind of structural information are available for these uh, receptors? And if you, I mean, if you probe this question from computational point of view, we have to have some validation, right? So we do, yeah. So, uh, so for most of the toll light receptor, I will argue all nine of the main of the best characterized toll light receptors, the ring ion helicase receptors, and a third of the NORs have structural data, public good assessment. Uh, the problem are the other ones that aren't published or aren't publicly available. The other problem is that these things are really hard to purify. Right? 
right? They they are all, they have authorization domains. They auto-memorize. They, they muck up these types of questions. So what you end up having are partial structures, typically loose in entry detail or the core domain, rather than getting the full length. Yep. Going back to the RSV question, um, would you try to make an accident specific argument that that is set here? Yeah, so the question is, when we try to target the R, so in looking at RSV, when we try to design a vaccine to target the, the, the MRP3 in this case, the answer is no, because when we inhibit MRP3, we actually end up getting a much worse condition. What you could design, though, are ways to enhance MRP3 recognition. And to do that, we really need more biological information about what it's sensing. It's a big mystery what exactly it's sensing. At this point, we just hedge our bets and say some change in the intracellular environment. And that's driven by RSV infection, as well as influenza. There's a lot of parallels between RSV and influenza, of course, they're, they're very similar types of viruses. Yep. So, if you were to follow some of the literature surrounding the role of oxidative stress, I think it's more Yep. And um, I'm just wondering are there any differences between these two? Yep. So, the question. Yes. All right. So, the, the, the question is. Uh, I guess the statement is that there are there is quite a bit of literature looking at reaction to oxygen species activation of MR glycosides. Uh, the follow-up to that is are there any is there any subtype specificity associated with neutrophils versus macrophages, for example? Um, a lot of our work has shown that uh, reactive oxygen species uh, so there's two answers to your question. So in the context of the inflammasome, MRP3 inflammasome, reactive oxygen species production triggers inflammasome activation in both neutrophils as well as macrophages. So it's odd because neutrophils produce reactive oxygen species, but they can also be self-activated by it as well. Um, and so there's a lot of work that, that we've looked at that reactive oxygen species seem to specifically activate the MRP3 inflammasome in the context of a lot of different diseases. Flu, for example, uh, we, we looked at, we've said that when we, inhibit, when we inhibit reactive oxygen species production, we don't get inflammasome activation as well. That's effective. Okay? MRP3 inflammasome and that's associated with its role in activating influenza. We use drugs to inhibit reactive oxygen species production in the context of flu and also uh, several different pathogens associated with patterns like poly IC, so virus related uh, uh, agonists. Now, the reverse of that is that some of these MLRs, like MLRs1, have been shown to actually produce reactive oxygen species. This is a positive regulator of reactive oxygen species production. And so you have this system set up where Activation of MRX1 by, say, influenza or by a bacteria can produce reactive oxygen species, which then causes the activation of the MRP3 and the production model. Is that answer your question? Yeah. Sure. We use a, there's a, we have a paper in immunity. We used a dozen different ones, in vivo as well as in vitro. Um, PPI is one, uh, we, and then there's a, there's, there's the, there are drugs like 2213, diazole, whatever, or another. Get them at Sigma, right? So, <laughs> in general, we, 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 we haven't we, we've been able to use the basic drug targeting. But there's, a, there's quite a bit of literature, there's a paper in Nature and Knowledge looking at loss production. Okay? Julian, thank you for your very interesting presentation.